Howdy, folks, and welcome. Uh, so excited to see so many people live, and I can tell you hundreds of others uh, are registered, and we know this is the third in the series of Imaginal Cells of the Solidarity Economy webinar series. We've had uh, over 500 downloads, so the point is today, Imaginal Cells of the Solidarity Economy colon politics and policy uh, is going to be a session where we drill down onto different uh, approaches, right? Uh, and by that, I mean participatory budgeting and public banking and worker-owned cooperatives and a community land trust. Those are all individual reforms that are achievable right now uh, and that are happening all across the country. And so yay that. And we're going to have experts in each of those four fields give you a seven to 10 minute big picture overview of what those are. For some of you, that may be uh, the first uh, introduction to those. Others, it'll just be a refresher, right? Uh, but the point is that each of those are achievable, they make people's lives better, and they are profound. But alone, they do not actually undermine capitalism. They do not transform the system. They make individual lives better, to be sure, but they're not alone transformational. And that's the kick. At the U.S. Solidarity Economy Network, we believe we need to democratize the entire economy. We need a new system. And that system for us is explicitly and clearly post-capitalist. It explicitly dismantles the institutions of white supremacy and heteropatriarchy and settler colonialism. But we know we can't just jump from here to there. We actually have to take steps. So the framing is these taken together can be non-reformist reform. And what that means is that if all of these were happening in any one community, we would really be achieving a version of revolution using dual power. And so it is my pleasure to say first, welcome. Uh, second, uh, to acknowledge that this is a collaborative process from the US Solidarity Economy Network and the New Economy Coalition and Shareable and the Democracy Collaborative and the Wellbeing Economic Alliance are sure. we all. So it's very exciting to us to actually show this is what it means to actually uh, be working together uh, in order to completely transform society. Uh, the first speaker that we're going to hear from is Petula Hanley. Petula is the coordinator of the Democracy Beyond Elections Coalition, which is an another bigger coalition. And she is also on staff with the Participatory Budgeting Project. And Petula is going to give us the big picture overview on participatory budgeting. Petula, where are you at? There you are. I'm right here. Hi, everyone. I hope everyone is doing well today. I'm Petula Jarvis Hanley. My pronouns are she, her. I am Zooming in from Brooklyn, New York, and I'm so excited to see you all on the call today as we talk about imaginal cells of solidarity economy, uh, politics, and policy. And so I am the DBE Coalition Manager at the Participatory Bidding Project, um, and would just like an idea dear if you could just put a thumbs up um using uh your reactions how many of you know about pbp that is the participatory budgeting project just give us a thumbs up um i'm going to share my screen as i get ready to present i'm seeing a couple of thumbs well quite a few i'm going to unspotlight myself um since i'm going to be sharing all right, so I see a few thumbs up. Uh, so for some of you, this would be information you already know or familiar with or participated with and in. And for others, this may be totally new. Um, so uh, the Participatory Budgeting Project has been around since uh, 2009. And we strive to transform a democracy uh, and center community power and have helped over 700,000 people in over 30 countries across North America 
um, spend over $400 million of public funds. Uh, we do this through technical assist assistance, shared learning, research, and advocacy. Um, and if you'll just give me two seconds, let's get the screen going. I'm sharing. Let me know if you can see my screen clearly. And let's get to the beginning of the presentation. <laughs> So um, if you would like to learn more afterwards about uh, the participatory budgeting project and specifically uh, Democracy Beyond Election, which is a subcircle um, within um, PBP, um, the websites are here. Um, it's participatorybudgeting.org. Um, if David, if you could drop those two uh, links on, on websites in the chat just for folks to so start browsing through what it is that we do. So uh, we strive uh, my, to collaboratively transform democracy uh, to center community power, and we work across the nation, as I mentioned before. We have staff members in uh, Oakland, in Seattle, uh, New York, Cali, Los Angeles, um, and the Bay Area, um, and Canada uh, as well. Okay. So how many folks on the call have participated in some way in a PB process or know of a PB process? You could use your reactions again. Um, just give me an idea of who's totally new to participatory budgeting. Some may have some ideas. Some may have participated in some way or another. Let's see. I see a couple of thumbs up. I do see uh, some familiar um, folks, names on the call, Annie, Abby, uh, David Ferris. Okay, awesome. So participatory budgeting is a democratic process in which community members directly decide how to spend part of a public budget. Uh, this budget, comes from various sources in various municipalities. So for example, it could be a city budget, it could be a school district budget, it could be a public agency, it can even be a non-for-profit budget, discretionary funds of elected officials. So um, the source um, comes from a variety of places. So what does participatory budgeting look like? There are six main steps in this process, which includes the design, brainstorming, developing proposals, voting, funding the actual project, and then of course, evaluating the process at the end. So let's spend a few minutes walking through a typical PB cycle. We're going to spend a little bit of time here around what's the very first step. So in designing the process, a steering committee, uh, which comprises of a representative sample of the community in which this process is going to occur, creates the rules and engagement for the plan. So there are some guidelines and some stipulations around whether it's capital funding, uh, the minimum cost of a project or the maximum cost of a project. Um, so the steering committee um, helps to put these guidelines together um, so that the process can run smoothly. Then there is a ton of community outreach where we collect ideas. It's called the uh, idea collection um, um, step in the process community members from school age all the way up, we are sharing ideas. What do we wanna see change in our community? As we imagine what we wanna make better, what impact we wanna have. And so through meetings, through online tools, outreach um, in various ways, ideas are put forth from community members. Then these ideas are then further developed by another group of community members called budget delegates. So where do the ideas come from? Everyone, we do have a group of, of community uh, leaders and, and members and 
uh, who would then become budget delegates to develop the ideas into a proposal. And these budget delegates use the guidelines from the steering committee around feasibility, cost, uh, um, et cetera, to decide, okay, some of these ideas are great, but may not meet this particular guideline, so we can't develop them into proposals. But then they go ahead and spend some time researching um, around uh, developing the ideas into a proposal, which then goes to the fourth state onto a ballot. In some municipalities and cities and towns, um, community members as young as 14 or in some cases 11 can vote and have a say and, and be a budget delegate in how this public fund is spent. And so the voting, uh, it's again, similar to the idea collection where we have pop-up vote sites, we vote at schools, at community meetings, um, online as well. There's an online voting tool where that particular community would then vote for the ideas that they think should win um, this particular amount of funding. And of course, once voting has ended and the winning projects have been identified, then the organization implements the winning ideas. And I don't know how many of you remember uh, being in school and um, getting your test back and your teacher says to you, everything that you didn't get correct, we're going to review that. We're going to evaluate it. Did you not understand the question? You know, so the evaluation process is key in implementing the PB um, process and ensuring that it continues to be a successful tool for community led decision making. So that is the process in a nutshell. And I can share an example of um, a school district. So now we're using, if we if we think about types of funds that are, are used um, for this process, one of the types of fund listed was funds from school district. And a school district in, in Rhode Island, in Central Fall Rhode Island, um, implemented PB for the very first time in 2019, where uh, students allocated $10,000 to improve their school in a semester long elective class. So just step back for a second. Remember your first year in high school as a, I'm sorry, as a freshman in high school and walking into a class and your teacher says to you, hey, we have $10,000 to spend. How would you like to spend it to improve your school? What do you imagine that you would have said in that moment? And so um, in 2019, Central Hall, uh, Falls High School completed their first PB project. But fast forward to 2021, where, you know, students, student leaders, parents, teachers, we were all in some form of lockdown, et cetera, were then presented with $100,000 of COVID recovery money, of the ARPA money, the American Rescue Plan Act money to for students and the community in, in that particular school district and parents to say, hey, we have this COVID relief money. This is what we want to do with it. And so that's exactly what happened in Central Falls, Rhode Island in, in 2021, uh, where students and parents voted how to... Um, utilize $100,000 of the American Rescue Plan Act money. And they voted and chose uh, to to extracurricular activities. And I probably would have voted the same way, tired of being inside, uh, needing to um, just balance out um, extracurricular activities, being outside and just feeling more engaged and more connected to my community again. And so 90% of the delegates, which came from the school, there were student leaders. Um, I can see some of you here who were probably, who would have probably been for argument's sake, you know, um, the, the, the president of the student body and parents and community members who want to see the school thrive and do well. They made up the um, 
uh, they were budget delegates. And 90% of the delegates said that they felt listened to by their committees. 73% of the delegates said that they made uh, new relationships in, the, in their committees. Why is this data important? This data is, shows how practices like participatory budgeting can and has shown to increase equity, access, and accountability in spending decisions, transforming and deepening democracy. So let's imagine maybe not a student, but present day you here on the call, if you had access to a percentage of the COVID money that came through uh, your community, what may you have want to see the money utilized for? How could you have articulated that and then actually seen your idea develop into a proposal and actually implemented right before your eyes? So that is why Democracy Beyond Election <clears throat> Coalition presented 11 awardees across the country, including versus Conpradir in Central Falls um, School District, money to invest, develop, expand, and create long-term participatory processes to help equitably distribute not just ARPA funds, but future funds as well. So I just said Democracy Beyond Election Coalition, and I'm sure some of you are wondering, okay, well, what's what's the distinction uh, between PBP and DBE? It's not really a distinction. It's just that the DBE subcircle specifically um, uh, is a part of the PBP organization. Uh, we are part of campaigns and ad ad uh, advocacy um, initiatives. Um, and here at DBE, we have approximately 27 organizations. Uh, some are national, some are local, uh, some are coalitions themselves, uh, such as USEN, New Economy Coalition, um, Take Root Justice. And we collaborate um, around uh, national campaigns that's dedicated to participatory democracy rooted in community-led decision-making. We are dedicated to transforming uh, democracy. And I can uh, I will drop the, the link uh, to our website so you can learn more about the Democracy Beyond Election Coalition as an entity of PBP and uh, celebrating um, the implementation of using PB, participatory budgeting, to equitably distribute um, ARPA, American Rescue and Act plan funds. Our core principles at DBE are ensuring that we um, promote community-led decision-making power that is equitable, accessible, and significant. Now, participatory budgeting, and I'm going to wrap up in a couple seconds, I believe I'm at time, it's just an aspect of democracy, participatory democracy. And so um, the coalition, together we learn and we share other practices, uh, other participatory practices, other democracy practices, such as citizens' assemblies, participatory budgeting, uh, which I spoke on already, legislative theater, participatory action research, et cetera, as we expand our toolkits and continue to center uh, the voices of the underprivileged and all and center power within our communities. So I'm gonna wrap up here for now and I'm gonna pass it back to David. Um, and I'm looking forward to answering uh, questions uh, later on. So thank you so much, Patula. And if I could ask uh, to be spotlighted, thank you so much. Uh, that was exciting, right? And I'm going to give you a little hint or a peek behind the curtain. I want you to imagine that we've gone through a participatory budgeting project in our community. You know, the one where we actually live, work, 
play and pray with neighbors that we see every day at the co-op grocery store and uh, on the street. And the decision that the group made was, let's really focus in on affordable housing. That's the thing. So now the next person we'll hear from is Lydia Lopez. Uh, Lydia is, I want to say, like all of these are uh, uh, people that I know. Uh, and so Lydia is the co-coordinator of the California Community Land Trust Network and a colleague and comrade on the board of directors of the U.S. Solidarity Economy Network. And so Lydia is going to say, hey, this group said through a participatory budgeting process, let's build affordable housing. Lydia says, I've got an idea on how to use a non-reformist reform to build affording housing. So Lydia, take it away. Thank you, David. Um, my name is Lydia Lopez and I'm with the California Community Land Trust Network. And thank you everyone for uh, joining us today. Um, we are a statewide network of community land trust organizations statewide uh, who steward land and affordable housing some of the projects include uh, also um, mixed uses. This could look like uh, housing development that could be single family homes or a condo building. Could also include uh, urban farming, non-profit non spaces and micro business spaces. And our membership in California is very diverse uh, from Northern California to Southern California close to the border currently expanding also to the Central Valley. And our membership also includes indigenous groups and grassroots organizers, uh, including some uh, tenant organizers that have been successful purchasing their own buildings where they used to be renters. As a network, uh, we represent over 40 established uh, and emerging uh, community land trusts. And our membership is not limited to CLTs. We also collaborate with other groups that guide our work and our priorities and collaborate on various projects. And a lot of you may be wondering uh, what is a community land trust? Um, and I can uh, you know, definitely address some of that uh, in the beginning. Uh, the community land trust is a legal structure uh, where the ownership of the land is split from the ownership of the buildings. Uh, and that's the main difference uh, with this uh, type of development. Uh, I'll share some slides with you all also to illustrate this. Um, the resident uh, owns a, a condo or a single family home under this structure, but they don't own the land. Still, the home ownership provides the resident and their family with housing stability, with limited equity, and with inheritance rights. The home is affordable precisely because the resident is not purchasing the land. They only purchase the building. The land is held in trust for the community by a community land trust nonprofit corporation, ensuring that the community interests uh, are protected in perpetuity. Um, one third of the board of the community land trust nonprofit consists of residents of the affordable housing and this board uh, decides what projects to include in the land trust, from housing to other mixed uses. And we're also exploring uh, a bigger role for agricultural projects with some of the San Joaquin Valley organizations um, where you know, they have uh, issues with access to water, access to land and entrenched politics uh, for a lot of the residents that have traditionally been, uh, you know, uh, living in that area. Uh, the relationship between the community land trust and the homeowner is laid out by a renewable 99 year ground lease. This is a contract between the CLT nonprofit and each homeowner. The contract en ensures exclusive use of the land for community purposes and permanent affordability of the housing through a formula uh, with resale price restrictions. And uh, I'm gonna go ahead and share uh, some slides with you to illustrate all of this. It will uh, make more sense. And 
Can everyone see my uh, screen? Thank you. So um, this is the hallmark of a community land trust is the split of ownership from the building and the land where the resident purchases the building. Uh, this could look also like rentals. Not everyone is home ownership ready right off the bat. So the community land trust, um, besides holding the land in trust for the community purposes that the board uh, decides, um, they also provide services to the community. The services could include uh, referrals to uh, needed services, uh, other connections to uh, jobs or other um, critical needs, as well as uh, financial education. In some cases, this looks like credit repair or other services that the community needs in order to become homeowner ready. So there could also be an arc where a community organizes or a neighborhood organizes for a project like this. They start out as rentals with the plan to become uh, homeowners in the next three to five years. And the 99 year ground lease uh, illustrated here ensures the exclusive use of the land and continued affordability through the resale price restrictions. Uh, also, I would like to point out that uh, with a lot of uh, projects that are labeled affordable housing, uh, a lot of the affordability restrictions ex expire after a number of years. And so um, the project uh, then uh, can be sold at market rate for the profit of the developer or for, for the profit of other players, depending how this was structured. With a community land trust, this never happens um, because the 99 year ground lease is renewed automatically and the homeowner always has the choice to resell the property, the building, back to the land trust as laid out in the contract. Uh, they have the right of first refusal. And the homeowner also has the possibility to, um, to leave the property to their heirs. Uh, finally, um, the community ownership of the land um, ensures that the community interests uh, take priority over uh, speculators, uh, you know, just uh, using this land uh, for extracting profits. Uh, here you can see the same thing. Uh, I'm borrowing this graphic from one of our network members in Oakland. Uh, this illustrates the various types of projects, um, you know, could take, uh, could take place as a single family home uh, or as a limited equity housing co-op um, or as a condominium with um, you know, property manager and the typical uh, things you see in a condominium uh, with a hired uh, property manager or with the residents taking on that role. It really depends on how involved are the residents and how ready they are to take on uh, responsibilities. With something like the limit, limited equity housing co-op, uh, there's more involvement by the residents uh, that's not always possible, though. And, and finally, uh, you know, you could have also a multifamily uh, rental, uh, depending on whether the residents are ready to uh, become homeowners at that point. Other uses uh, could include really anything that the community wants and needs. Uh, this could be urban farms, micro business, uh, open spaces, and other uses. Uh, some of our members, for example, uh, run their uh, urban farm and they're adding micro business spaces to have an outlet for the produce that they uh, produce organically or to have an outlet for catering using those products from the urban farming. And otherwise, uh, it, it's really the community that gets to decide uh, how to develop that project and what uses to, to include. Uh, I can't really go in depth into all of these exciting case studies, but I just wanted to give you a little taste of the kind of things that that uh, have played out with some of the projects that we see as uh, part of our network. Um, Dishgamu Humboldt CLT, um, which is how I originally got connected with David Cobb, and thank you for inviting me to present here, um, involves the rematriation of land and a partnership with the government after uh, the community organized 
to have this land returned to the Wiyot tribe. Uh, there's other examples of strategic partnerships in San Francisco um, as part of the housing stock uh, preservation. Um, the San Francisco uh, Community Land Trust uh, has partnered uh, with the city and with the county. Uh, there's other examples in Marin, where the Community Land Trust Association of West Marin uh, has used uh, other innovative ways to acquire land through plant giving, uh, where a homeowner can, for example, um, retain a life estate and then uh, the property passes to the community land trust after the homeowner uh, passes away. Uh, the homeowner in this situation could not afford to repair her roof, was behind paying their property taxes, and ended up selling the property at half price. This is a million dollar property to clam. And the homeowner uh, is a win-win for the homeowner as well. Uh, she gets to live in her property uh, for the rest of uh, her life estate and she has a new roof that uh, Clam uh, is uh, putting uh, for her. And also Clam paid the back taxes as part of that contract, you know, that deal. Uh, then there's also other examples uh, around the Bay Area and in Southern California. Uh, in the Bay Area CLT uh, partnered with a Baptist church that donated the land. Um, there's a lot of interest from uh, some of the churches to collaborate uh, for affordable housing projects um, statewide. And in Irvine, uh, this was a community land trust incubated by the municipal government in Irvine to provide workforce housing. A lot of cities uh, all over California and I'm sure countrywide are having a really hard time even staffing some of the critical, uh, you know, some of the critical positions uh, for uh, lower income and med medium income. And so um, this was an incubation by the actual city of Irvine. And finally, uh, there's another example in Long Beach. It was a partnership, partnership with local government. And in this case, the city of Long Beach uh, has a housing element that uh, decides the planning for housing for the next 10 years. And they had specifically mentioned community land trust in their housing element. And so the community organized around pushing the city to uh, dedicate part of the budget to uh, incubating the first community land trust in the city. So um, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen, uh, but I just want to emphasize that uh, Similar to what Petula uh, was covering uh, about community engagement and this leading to positive outcomes, including equity, access, and accountability uh, for public spending. You know, this is one area that is ripe for collaboration uh, with community land trusts. And we're very happy to see that, uh, at least in California, uh, it's one area that's growing a lot. Uh, there's a lot of interest in land trusts. There's a lot of municipal governments that are reaching out, uh, you know, to try to learn more about this model of affordable housing. And the issue of housing uh, is, is something that has really impacted uh, BIPOC, BIPOC communities, low income communities, uh, indigenous groups uh, and other vulnerable communities, even, uh, you know, middle income folks uh, are hurting because the rents uh, and the price of housing is just so overly inflated everywhere. And so uh, we do this work uh, because we care about preventing displacement and we care about, uh, you know, doing something uh, meaningful to give access to communities uh, to have a say in what happens in their neighborhood and to have a say with what happens with the land and access to land. And so, um, this is an avenue to uh, preserve and rehabilitate existing housing. And some projects are brand new projects coming off the ground, but a lot of the projects are pres uh, housing preservation and rehabilitation. And finally, I, I would just like to say that investing in a project um, like community land trust is a responsible use of public funding and other funding because these projects are gonna be permanently affordable. Uh, the affordability restriction doesn't expire. So we're always looking for collaborators uh, to continue making this work uh, sustainable.
Thank you. Thank you so much, Lydia. And so now folks, remember we've gone through a participatory process where our community decided affordable housing was what we wanted to focus on. And then we heard from Lydia and worked with our local community land trust to either create a community land trust or more than likely to partner with an existing community land trust to begin building affordable housing. And so wait, there's more for those of you of the generation who remembers Ron Popeil. Now we're going to say, how do we finance that thing? And luckily, G. Young Park has an idea for us. G. Young is a lawyer with the Sustainable Economies Law Center. She also has a private practice where she assists clients uh, on sustainable, uh, or pardon me, solidarity economy projects and others. But more importantly for our purposes, she is a leader in public banking Los Angeles. So G. Young Park is going to suggest to us a way to finance our affordable housing. Uh, Ji Young, you're up. Thank you so much for having me. I um, am very passionate about um, the sustainable economy. So I am very happy to be here and honored. Um, I do wanna clarify though that um, I do not work for Sustainable Economies Legal Center. I am an, a Sustainable Economies Center Legal Sustainable Economies Legal Center Fellow. Um, my pronouns are she, her, and I am in Los Angeles. Um, I am going to share my screen now. Hmm. Can you see my screen? I still, I see you, uh, Ji Young, but I'm not actually seeing that you've shared your screen yet. Um, uh, It looks like I might not. Are you no longer, let's see if it. Well, you are a host. You should be able to share your screen at the green button uh, at the center bottom of your screen. It says, uh, allow Zoom to share your screen. Open system preferences, whoops. Well, as Ji Young, please uh, try to do that because I know you were planning on sharing your screen and to listeners on the podcast and to those of us who are live, I'll just channel my mama, which is Southern for grandmother, who taught me this wonderful saying, which I want to share with you. And it goes like this. Oh, did you have this problem or that problem? Did you make this mistake or that mistake? I hope that's the worst thing that happens to you today. What a great day you're going to have. And that's something that as a child I've, I've learned and I've integrated and it's helped me uh, to relax and to make sure that uh, we all make mistakes. Th these little things are gonna happen and we'll get through them together. So Ji Young, did you get a chance to, uh, are you, I'm still just seeing you, I'm so sorry. I, I'm not able to. Yeah, so I sent you a link and um, I was wondering if you could actually share your screen. Let or me try to do that. Sorry about this. That's okay. Let's let's figure out this as we go. Let me share my screen. Are folks seeing my sc uh, this screen now that says Public Banking LA? Yes. So I think you can see my screen now. <laughs> and then can are you able to? Um... I, I, I'm on slide two. Can you can you click on slideshow up in the right? I uh, sure can. Yeah. All right. So um, I just want to give some background on what a public bank is. So I'm working uh, with a whole team that is all volunteer, uh, no 
entity whatsoever, not a nonprofit. We're just some people who really want uh, some equity in our economy in here in Los Angeles. And um, so the Los Angeles Public Bank will be a city owned and operated financial institution with a public mandate to prioritize the needs of the community. The bank will provide a sustainable con community controlled financial solution that empowers residents and directs funding towards local priorities. By leveraging deposit base and lending power, the LA Public Bank will offer affordable housing, small business loans and funding for modernizing public in infrastructure among other critical community needs. The LA Public Bank will play a key role in promoting economic development, community investment, and financial stability for the city and its residents. Next slide, please. So the LA Public Bank will focus on social and environmental responsibility, serving the needs of marginalized and underserved communities, including people who have, who just haven't traditionally banked and people who go to the, you know, predatory um, payday uh, check cashing places, um, keeping public funds within the community and returning profits and interest to the city supports LA's long-term economic health. As a publicly governed bank, it supports democratic oversight and transparency in handling public funds, ensuring accountability to LA communities and responsiveness to the people rather than private shareholders. A public bank can meet community needs that traditional banks aren't meeting, such as lending to cooperatives, but people have to demand products like this. So I just wanna preface everything by saying, you know, this is our vision for a public bank. Um, the status of the public banking movement here in LA is that um, the LA City Council did pass a, um, a motion to have a request for uh, request for proposals from um, from possible consultants who would conduct a study on the feasibility of a public bank. So it's it's in the um, kind of evaluation analysis stage at this point, and it recently the the funding for the um, for the study and analysis was um, voted on by the city council and um, they voted to go ahead and fund the um, study. Uh, so why found why found a public bank? And that's the re the reason it's like a no-brainer to align the public markets, lending priorities with the city's lending needs. So that there are, I, I believe, over 60,000 unhoused people probably, you know, it's growing every day because the, the rents are so high here. Um, green infrastructure, financial justice. And for me, I got involved in, in public banking, in the public, public banking effort because I want public banking to support sustainable economies. Next slide, please. So the advantages of having a public bank, um, a community owned bank, is that it keeps public money invested within the local community. It divests from the big banks and Wall Street um, and keeps it in Los Angeles and surrounding areas. Um, it returns a significant portion of the profits and interest that is saved um, from not banking with the big banks to the local residents and businesses. It aligns with community values and prioritizes investments in community identified projects because ideally there will be, um, we will incorporate, you know, participatory um, decision making into the governance of the public bank. It, it would significantly reduce the cost of infrastructure creation and repair by half, making funds available for all of the things that we so sorely need. <laughs> um, it promotes transparency and democratic control 
Uh, there's a white paper that is on the Public Bank LA website about governance. Um, the person who wrote it, Michael Brennan, uh, interviewed so many different people from, from all walks of life uh, to um, put together the, the white paper. And the, again, the idea behind the governance for public banking is that there, there will be um, uh, some participatory decision-making. Um, it leverages the bank's resources to increase local lending and meet community needs in partnership with local financial institutions such as community banks, credit unions, CDFIs, and, and my hope is also um, lenders uh, to um, co-ops. Um, it would also support local banks and credit unions, and it would establish a long-term source of capital that benefits current and future generations of residents and businesses. Next slide, please. Um, I think we, we uh, went over most of this. We can go on. Um, okay, so currently the big banks are investing in fossil fuels. That is not sustainable. Um, they're also very discriminatory. Uh, in their lending practices, um, the the city and most um, most government govern uh, governing entities um, do a lot of their financing by by um, passing bonds. And if we have public banks, we wouldn't need to do that, um, and it would free up a lot of a lot of funding for infrastructure um, and other services. Um, so, uh, you know, people are like, the critics are, are, are like, um, that's not gonna work. Uh, well, it, it is working. The Bank of North Dakota has existed for, um, I believe a century, um, a very long time <laughs> and um it it weathered the uh it weathers um financial downturns better than uh better than private banks um it's had uh record profits and uh the return on investment is 18 percent for the state so the argument that it it can't work is just proven to be wrong um, it's also done in in, um, in uh, China, Korea, um, Germany, um, nationally. Next slide, please. Okay, so it's a very exciting time in California. Um, I'm focusing on California because I am in California. <laughs> um, but there, there are um, public banking efforts in... San Francisco, East Bay, Central Coast, Pomona Valley, Santa Rosa, San Diego, Sacramento, South Bay, North Coast, Philadelphia, Massachusetts, Oregon, New York, Washington, New Hampshire, and probably other places. And um, there was so much text that I really wanted to incorporate a picture. And so please acknowledge my let's go picture. <laughs> <laughs> All right, next slide, please. Um, why now? So, um, as mentioned, as it was mentioned, extractive capitalism is clearly failing us all. Um, and we're able to do this now, uh, the, because the California Public Banking Act was passed in 2019, which allows cities, counties, um, and other municipalities to, um, establish, uh, public banks. So now we get into how it can actually support a sustainable economy. Um, and I wanted to talk about housing first. Um, so it can, a, a public bank can provide specialized financing for more equitable forms of housing development like community land trusts, which were discussed, uh, resident owned communities, which are manufactured housing neighborhoods like mobile home parks. Um, 
which I think are probably going to get more popular because the price of land and building is just getting more and more cost prohibitive. Uh, limited equity housing cooperatives, uh, which were discussed, and mixed income social housing. Next slide, please. Um, oh, okay. So in Los Angeles, uh, we have had the um, good fortune to have um, a board of supervisors who um, see the value in community land trusts and in 2020 invested 14 million into a CLT pilot program to help five community land trusts acquire and rehab eight residential properties across the county. They were smaller multi-unit apartment buildings, which um, normally wouldn't be um, converted to a CLT or, or to um, uh, affordable housing even because there are so few units. Um, and uh, it was already discussed um, that uh, about how they work with um, limited housing, uh, limited equity housing cooperatives. So we can move on to the next slide. Um, and then with respect to worker cooperatives, um, when I was uh, getting questions from people who want to form worker cooperatives, uh, I kept coming across the issue of them of the people not being able to access financing um, because, uh, you know, for one thing, people, a lot of people just don't have savings um, or they don't have enough savings or they can't, uh, they don't have the collateral to um, get a loan. Um, and with a cooperative, it's, you know, owned by multiple people and in traditional, um, lending programs in private in the private banks they want a single um a single guarantor um who has lots of assets and that just doesn't exist for a lot of people so um then there is a, a lot you know when they are able to access financing it's not enough to um hold the co-op folks through an incubation period where they're, you know, where they have the time to, um, you know, get the business up and running. And there is also a lack of support a lot of the time. Um, we're lucky to have uh, some orgs that do provide incubation support like LA Co-op Lab, but um, actually, I don't even know if there are any others in, in LA. Um, and then also historic discrimination, which is a big one, and I should have put it higher up because that's just huge. Um, and uh, next slide. So how does, how can public banking help worker cooperatives? Uh, they hopefully um, will provide um, non-traditional lending programs, which uh, aren't just based on a single uh, guarantor's assets, but will also consider proof of multiple borrowers' ability to repay um, based on the equity of the business, cash flow, and um, profitability. Um, and, you know, the, the hope is that they would, that the public bank would also provide non- extractive financing, um, where the loan payments are based on a percentage of the profit so that if the business doesn't make any, um, you know, doesn't turn a profit in, uh, in one month, then the, the, um, the borrower doesn't have to pay for that month. Um, and it doesn't just go out of business forever. Um, next slide. Uh, so hopefully uh, the public bank will provide specialized financing for more equitable forms of lending by participating in loans to community wealth build, building or uh, institutions in, initiated by local lenders 
So LA Co-op Lab works with an organization called Seed Commons, which provides non-traditional lending to worker co-ops and hopefully the uh, public bank could work with an organization like Seed Commons that has a lot of experience working with um, co-ops to, um, to uh, support more worker co-ops. Um, and uh, I'm gonna try to wrap it up here. Um, and hopefully uh, the public bank will provide free or low cost technical assistance to folks who need it, um, whether it's a, a, a you know, a co-op or not. Um, and then hopefully it will uh, have a program that provides lending for employee ownership transitions. So that would be um, when the workers of a private business will um, actually convert the business to um, to a fully employee owned um, entity. And um, that is something that the a report by the uh, Berggruen Institute um, um, talked about. They said that um, there will be a, what they called a silver tsunami because there are so many older folks who own businesses and as they retire, uh, the employee ownership transition lending can um, make it so that the employees can take over these all of these businesses that you know alone uh, the an, one employee might not be able to um, buy so uh, or or take a loan against uh, for to purchase um, and next slide please. Next slide, please. Um, actually, next slide. Uh, this is the report that I was referring to. Uh, Yang Family Institute, Jane Family Institute, and Bergen Institute uh, worked on a series of papers that talk about um, public banking, specifically in Los Angeles, but you know it, it can apply to um, many other places. And uh, um, please uh, check it out on the Yang Family Institute website. Um, here are some more resources if you want to learn more. And uh, I will leave it there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ji Young, for that. And just as a reminder, as a community, we decided through a participatory project, affordable housing. Then we said, well, then how will we, uh, how should we do affordable housing? And Lydia Lopez showed us how a community land trust could be a truly democratic, sustainable way to build housing, a legal structure. Then Ji Young says, Oh, and we can finance it democratically, sustainably through the use of public banking. So now it's time to build it. And we're going to bring in my friend and comrade Kali Akuno of Cooperation Jackson, who's got experience actually at all of these things. Uh, but in this, in this occasion, he's going to give us the high level of co-op of, of worker owned cooperatives and how it fits into this ecosystem. Kali, take it away. Uh, good, good afternoon, everybody. Um, uh, and good morning to some people, depending on where you're at. Um, I'm Kali Akuno with uh, Cooperation Jackson. Um, and I too actually have had a little slide presentation that I was going to show. But many of you who know me know I, 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 I'm not a fan of doing slide presentations. I like watching everybody else's, um, but I'm much more uh, of a freestyle artist. And, and this this is one of the reasons why uh, I prefer to do it this way. Let me explain to you why. So uh, as David noted, we have we have been, I would say, experimenting with combining all the different elements that are being discussed here within the context of uh, Jackson. And uh, for a number of different reasons, 
you know, a number of different things have uh, varying degrees of uh, success. Um, one of the critical things that we wanted to do and are still aiming to do is try to create a municipal bank um, here in, in uh, Jackson. That's one of the long standing things that we, we want to try and do um, for a number of different uh, reasons, but the one that was mainly just underscored, right, was to, to ensure um, that in a community which is under-resourced as Jackson has become, right, and just extracted from, that, that we had some pool of resources uh, that the community could command uh, to do and develop cooperatives, understanding that most of your standard institutions banking institutions will not lend to working class black people and poor people uh, in particular, and we're gonna have to find some other ways to resource our own work. Um, but why I wanted to, to freestyle, let me start with just a, you know, kind of a basic outline. You know, there's, there are many types of cooperatives, um, consumer cooperatives, um, being one of them, one of the major uh, form, um, they are community cooperatives and they are worker cooperatives. So for this one in particular, we wanted to talk about worker cooperatives. Um, you know, and those are institutions, just in short, uh, where the workers come together uh, to uh, own their own labor, first and foremost, uh, and working together democratically to determine uh, what they produce, how they would produce it, um, under what terms and, and uh, conditions to the extent that they can control those, uh, and then how the benefits would be distributed amongst the workers. That's your standard kind of definition of a worker-owned kind of co-op in short. But I want to highlight a particular piece that we have been pushing uh, and advocating, and, and that to see these institutions uh, as instruments of working class self-organization you know, first and foremost, uh, and that these are kind of vital tools that we need in our community that help bridge a link that, that David was talking about earlier. And that is us being able to organize, you know, not only where we work, but where we live, where, where we play and where we pray. Uh, and not just see them as kind of one dimensional pieces that are only in situations where we work because one of the critical things you'll learn, like in a, your experience in a place like Jackson, um, where there's a chronic shortage of jobs and there are a number of people who have been kind of forced into independent type contractor uh, relationships, uh, is that the community is an actual broader site of not only living, but of actual production, either through direct means of uh, producing things that have like surplus value for a profit or more deeply and more actually sustainably all the different elements and aspects of social reproduction that take place to make everything possible. Uh, and I think the articulation of building these and viewing our work as kind of sites of, of uh, working class self-organization helps to bridge this kind of gap between the solid kind of, uh, the, I shouldn't say solid, but the kind of noted uh, types of, of labor, which are for a market and for to produce commodities relative to those things we need to do to sustain ourselves, the care uh, work uh, uh, that takes place. And this is a bridge between those two. And I want you to imagine uh, building these institutions, these worker cooperatives, uh, in a manner which will be able to support all the workers who are now on strike at the, the Amazon factories, right? Uh, or who are, are engaging in strikes at the, at the Starbucks uh, uh, and the Whole Foods and now uh, with the UAW. Imagine uh, if we had institutions in our community that were focused on this type of working class self-organization that could engage in the type of solidarity where we can not only bargain with the institutions of capital, but we could actually, um, dare I say, appropriate the different institutions uh, of capital by being able to act in concerted union with each other uh, across trades, across uh, boundaries uh, uh, that have kind of ar arbitrarily be constructed uh, for us by various earlier kind of concessions and agreements 
uh, um, between labor and capital that are kind of enshrined within the United States, because that uh, some of the limitations that we can engage, for instance, within the National Labor Relations Act, we can engage in political activities. Those are some of the various things that are really hurting uh, uh, organized labor and labor overall. I think in this country that we need uh, creative strategies that I think can be embedded in, in these uh, worker cooperatives uh, as broad kind of community organizing institutions that could flip the script for us on our behalf to make some real powerful interventions in the here and now. And so just imagine, you know, that uh, we took the core piece of workers owning and controlling their own uh, labor, labor time in their bodies, and that we married that with collective ownership of, of the means of production. And we determined through like planning councils that, that had uh, uh, time banking, that had alternative currencies when and where necessary, that had public banking, uh, that could rely upon uh, institutions like community land trusts uh, to be able to, to kind of fortify our, fortify our positions if and when there are capital strikes. And we know that's one of the tools that capital will use against us in our communities to try to bring us to heal. Imagine if we had all these things working in tandem with each other, how much more powerful we would be, how we'll be able to not only uh, 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 kind of resist many of uh, their tricks in their onslaughts, we'll be able to, ex to extend uh, our power to other communities and then work in a federated sense uh, all across this country and around the world uh, to be able to contain uh, capital and it's kind of moving to drain communities or dispossess us of, of power and, and, and direct kind of collective or common ownership. Um, so I, I just offer organizing ourselves um, Excuse me, I, I was trying to uh, rush. Imagine organizing ourselves in this particular manner in a way that we could then combine all the different elements that have been laid out here today to be able to really build on executing elements of dual power that that uh, were mentioned by, by uh, David earlier, uh, how much further we could be. Uh, and I just wanted for, for folks, I'm really here to promote and plug worker cooperatives, as I think everybody what's been doing, but to really promote this view of viewing, seeing what we're doing as all different instruments and elements of organizing ourselves in, in the broad sense of the working class towards deeper elements of, of self uh, organization so that we can stand on our own two feet, uh, push back. And then I didn't even mention or, or talk about how uh, this type of self organization could really alleviate one of the larger crises that we are all collectively facing, which is the climate calamity. Because if we were then in a position of, of really owning and controlling the means of production on the community level, we could eliminate so much of the waste and so much of the extraction that takes place so needlessly uh, uh, to just kind of maintain uh, uh, profits that we can produce on the basis of needs in our community rather than just on the basis a perpetual uh, growth and the need to kind of accumulate uh, a profit. So I'll end there, uh, just in the interest of, of uh, uh, time, I'll still send out some resources and uh, the, a little PowerPoint piece, but uh, I just had to get that plug in because I think uh, if you hadn't caught the undertow, this is a pretty remarkable time where we see different forces of labor the last two or three years have really been uh, pushing and making a, a major, pretty significant uh, reassertion of their 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 power, uh, and we should be talking with each other, the cooperative world and and the union world. There's some gaps and bridges that we need to to uh, kind of reconcile, but I want us to imagine uh, what a different world could look like if we put all the different pieces of what we're working on together. Uh, in our articulation of this this combination of things we call the build and fight formula. Uh, and so I just want to put that out uh, as part of a broader vision uh, of of how we build these cells of of power uh, and what are the elements we might need to 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 get ourselves there. Stop. Thank you, Kali. So let's bring all of our panelists uh, uh, back into the conversation. Uh, there have already been several questions uh, in the chat. I'm going to run through them quickly. I am going to underscore again what 
if we were in any one community, I'm not even talking about nationally, I mean, in one community, if we had a strong, vibrant working class that were using all of these tools that our amazing four panelists just described, y'all, we would be literally doing revolution. We would be restructuring the political economy. And that's the invitation and challenge. But this is the thing. We have to actually do it. We have to have social experimentation. And each of these presenters are skilled at actually doing each of these things. So what we're going to do now and continue, please, uh, to keep using the chat for comments, I'm going to turn. Mikiala's first uh, question was, are there situations where community members have successfully created a community land trust without government support? Lydia, that feels like it's right up your alley. Thank you, David. Um, yeah, think about uh, community land trust, land trust projects as any other acquisition of a property or land. And in the case of uh, community groups uh, looking for sources of funding, it can look at as a diverse uh, stream of funding that may include philanthropy, a fundraising campaign where the same neighbors raise funds, sometimes as much as a million and a half dollars. Uh, it could look like a commercial loan or other types of loans, include, including forgivable loans. Uh, this area obviously is ripe for collaborations with public bankers because there's traditionally not enough lending products that are consistent with the community land trust legal structure. Uh, otherwise, uh, there's also some funds uh, dedicated to this, specifically from CBAs or community-based uh, agreement, community bank agreements. Uh, these are the agreements that uh, banker conglomerates sign when they're merging with another bank. Although uh, they don't always live up to these agreements, but as a network, uh, we continue pushing for this area to, you know, to become more transparent. Um, otherwise. Um, the project could, it may or may not involve an initial government grant to help seed the project. So uh, by any means, like, I don't want you to come away thinking that all these projects have government support. Uh, majority of them don't have government support, but it's an area where we see a lot of growth because a lot of governments are realizing they need to invest more in their citizens by providing access to affordable housing and that this is closely tied to their economy uh, because without workers, uh, we don't have an economy. <laughs> and so uh, they're the, the backbone of that economy. And finally, uh, there's uh, also some state uh, funding that is sometimes available. Uh, as a network, uh, we work on policy and we were able to pass a foreclosure intervention housing pres preservation program that's just rolling out next year. And if you want to learn more about our uh, policies, uh, I'm going to share a link. And I would just like to mention that uh, also we have a lot of overlap with worker co-ops that are sometimes hosted uh, in the micro business spaces of community land trust. So uh, there's definitely, uh, you know, that's another area for growth uh, for the mixed use projects. Thank you, Lydia. Pambana asks, where does the money that a public bank lends come from? Ji Young, that sounds like it's your question. You, <laughs> us. <laughs> <laughs> We're investing in ourselves. How about that? <laughs> It's true. And uh, now I'm going to put on my hat uh, as the outreach director for the California Public Banking Alliance and say, in the case, uh, this is really important because as Kali said, most of these are just working class institutions, creating our own institutions and using them. And Lydia pointed out community land trusts usually are just individuals, but we're finding ways to force government to act. And I will say this, I'm not pretending for a moment that I think that we're actually taking state power when we do these things, but we're able to influence and sometimes uh, direct state power. And this is an example. Uh, in California, the, the, public land, the public banking law that was passed is the allowing the creation of up to 10 or up to six local or regional public banks. And Pambana, in this case, because it's state legislation, 
the only depositors for that can be government itself, right? So municipal governments, but also fire districts and water districts and school districts and so forth. So in the case of our pilot project, we're not going to be able uh, to offer banking for consumer lines, what's known as consumer lines. But this is the point. We have to build political power and clarity in order to exercise it. And I also want to clarify that, you know, the, the things that I was talking about in terms of public banking supporting sustainable economies, that is that is the goal. But we're not gonna do we're not gonna have it without people demanding it at every step of the way and paying attention and pushing for it. Because the let me you know, with that bill, with every bill that has to do with public banking and investing in our own communities and, and taking money away from Wall Street banks, the banking lobby is very strong and putting pouring a lot of money against fighting against public banking at every step. So please pay attention and please, please tell, put the pressure on the people who are voting for you. Power concedes nothing without a demand. It never did and it never will. Uh, Ellie asks, what are the panelists' thoughts on CDFIs, which stands for Community Development Financial Institutions, uh, and the impact it's been able to make or not make? So I'm just going to throw this open uh, to any of the panelists who might want to, to share. Uh, Petula or Kali, we haven't heard from you. CDFIs. Uh, I'll put it this way. I think they are, in, in this phase where we're at, they're, they're, like so many things, they're necessary, but they're not sufficient. You know, they're part of the tools we need in our toolkit. Uh, but we need to recognize, like all these things, for what they can do, uh, but what their limitations are. And where the limitations exist, we have to, you know, like pieces of a puzzle, you know, find the the, the pieces that then kind of conjoin uh, um, and have them, you know, kind of relate to each other through broad democratic means in a way that they can uplift and support each other and fill in the gaps uh, uh, in the different roles that we need to kind of move the broader agenda forward. Uh, but they are one piece uh, that I think uh, uh, needs to be there. Now, if you're asking me in terms of some some level of uh, prioritization, uh, I think I would prioritize kind of the construction of more more public banks and then have them be kind of embedded in a relationship with that. And that has to do with the positionality of power of of our communities, uh, which I think we we have more leverage uh, in terms of establishing those in terms of the public banks. Um, than some of the rules and regulations, you know, that kind of surround CDFIs. Uh, that that don't mean those rules and reg regulations can't change. Like all of this stuff uh, can can change, but it's going to take some significant organizing for any of this uh, uh, to really happen. Uh, uh, and we have to do the work. I was in part answering uh, one of the questions that came through on the chat, uh, and I'll, I'll finish doing that. Uh, kind of by what it, what it would take, I think, to kind of get some of this stuff uh, uh, to scale. And, and we do have to recognize, and I'll stop, that all of this is going to require us getting to scale. And I think we need, a, you know, to develop a common program and a common uh, vision to help us get us there. Then we're going to have to, like, do mass education and organizing around it to, to really move more people in our communities uh, uh, to adopt these different things and take them up. Uh, so that we can counter uh, the various forces of opposition that we're going to run into. I mean, you just uh, heard about some of them that that are are being mounted against public uh, banking and best believe, um, you know, uh, both political parties and all of their instruments are, are uh, when it comes down to it, very much opposed to many of the things that we're going to be uh, uh, proposing. And so we have to build the strength and capacity to not only resist that, uh, but the force to changes that we're going to need, you know, through broad democratic means. Thank you, Kali. Uh, I want to lift up uh, Annie, who wrote in to, to share that the Northwest, Northwest Co-op Development Center based in Olympia, Washington, has a strong record of converting so-called trailer parks into resident-owned communities in Washington state. So again, there are many examples of how that can happen. Um, I, uh, I feel like uh, the... Uh, Kali began to answer and touched on Robert's question, but I do want to 
ask it specifically to see if our other panelists also want to weigh in, because Robert asks, I'm wondering what role revolutionary and militant political action has in the transformation to a socialist and communist society in parallel to the economic reforms. Does political liberation come through building our own structures alongside it? This idea of building the new in the shell of the old versus the position that political liberation can only come after we overthrow and seize the capitalist state. So I personally appreciate that question. I appreciate how Kali has touched on it, but I do want to just invite Lydia or Petula or Ji Young if you'd like to react or respond to that question as well. Sorry, David, I missed the question. Can you repeat? <laughs> yes. What role does revolutionary and militant political action have in the transformation to a socialist and communist society? Is it building our own structures alongside the state? Or do we have to wait till we seize the state before we can create that society? Yeah, well, I mean, I think I think the work a lot of us are doing is revolutionary in and of itself. I mean, the idea of just splitting the property into uh, the land that the community stewards in perpetuity for their own purposes and designs and wants and needs is a revolution revolutionary concept in, in a lot of spaces. When you look at what's been happening with the commodification of land and just turning this resource that's really a basic resource everyone needs to survive, shelter, turning that into a commodity where we're just extracting profits from low income, BIPOC populations and other vulnerable populations. And so I, I think of all this work, the, the co-op work is turning upside down the whole capitalist structure, you know, by having the workers uh, be the owners of that enterprise and sharing on the profits fairly, as opposed to, you know, getting paid <laughs> pennies uh, and trying to survive in in locations where the cost of living alone, and when you compare the cost of living with what some employers pay, it's like workers, uh, you know, work, working under those conditions are subsidizing their employer and their profit, the employer's profits, if you, if you look at it that way. So, I mean, I think that all of this is revolutionary work in and of itself, uh, including the public banking and, and the other, you know, the participatory budgeting process. Ben writes in to say, it's so hard to scale up all these models beyond a minuscule slice of the economy and public budgets. How do we think we can build a mass politics that embraces these models and how we get to scale? So I'm going to use this as an opportunity to lift up and promote the U.S. Solidarity Economy Network's candidate questionnaire, uh, which is what we say, you know, the, the, uh, the, the, Nonprofit world has been depoliticized in this country to think that we're not allowed to engage in electoral politics. And that's just not true. I mean, it's definitely the nonprofit industrial complex is a problem, but you can still lobby uh, as long as it's less than 20% as a nonprofit. Uh, you can do candidate forums and candidate questionnaires. You can't electioneer for candidates as a 501c3, but a 501c3 can't imagine if in one community, you had a group of people coming together and asking any candidate for office. I don't care what party they're with. I don't care what office they're with. If we began to ask them the kind of concrete questions uh, that Ji Young was referencing to, kind, to exercise the kind of political power to say, what is your position on public banks and participatory budgeting and community land trust and worker co-ops? And here is draft legislation that would actually enhance it so that public monies were not only being used for participatory budgeting processes, but were facilitating the creation of more democratic means. I think to me, Ben, that's how I'm thinking about it. Um, I'm gonna add to that. Um, thank you, Ben, for um, lifting this up. Uh, specifically around public budgets, I've heard it said before, well, PB is only a slice of the pie, meaning particip using participatory budgeting um, process. It's only a percentage of public funds. Um, I know when um, participatory budgeting started in New York City, um, $1 million of a city council um, representative um, 
capital funding was given to the community to run a PB process. And even then, not all of the council members have participated um, and still not all of them do participate uh, currently. It's it's totally by choice. However, New York City and Boston did do a charter revision that required the mayor to invest yearly um, uh, a percentage of um, city funding towards um, participatory um, budgeting process. And um, in, in New York City, um, <clears throat> the People's Money uh, launched uh, just last year where I believe $5 million of um, the, the, the New York City budget goes towards uh, um, doing a PB specifically for uh, around expenditure funding. Um, and that's still such a small, very slice, very small slice of the pie. I totally agree. Um, but more recently, um, a colleague of mine, uh, Robbie Barton, did uh, lead a learning session around um, the people's budget. So there, just to distinguish, um, when we talk of the people's budget, sometimes we talk about it in terms of PB and that slice of pie, but an actual people's budget, it's a community-led decision-making approach to city budget with, in which a diverse coalition of community organizations put forth a full budget proposal. So not a percentage of the budget, but a full uh, budget proposal for annual city spending that would center the voice of its most marginalized and vulnerable uh, and invest in the communities and, and also take a look at the divest um, from harm and policing and prisons, et cetera. And I could drop that link in the in the chat for you. It's 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 something that we're learning more about. Um, it's happening in LA and I will share um, um, our our blog on the people's budget, full budget proposal, more of a divest invest model. We are saying, this is how the budget should be split up and, and be divided um, collectively, um, all people. Um, I think it's uh, it's another approach that's something that we can work on um, pushing forward. Back to you, David. I think um, you had a, a, a point. Yeah, I, I wanted to add that, um, you know, the, the kind of, um, the kind of uh, actions that we need aren't just in the kind of electoral realm or civic realm. I mean, it, it ultimately, you know, I think does have to be that ultimately, but I think it starts with us just having conversations about, um, you know, oh, hey, did you know that you can participate in um, particip participatory budgeting? Or did you know about worker cooperatives and you can own your own business with other people and, um, you know, incorporating it into our culture, our just regular conversations, our art um, and, and, and demystify it and not have it be like a weird thing or a foreign thing, um, but just something that we're entitled to. <laughs> um, and 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 so that people will feel empowered to participate um, because there are a lot of people who just aren't participating. Um, and so uh, I would that's what I would like to see. Friends, and dare I say comrades, our time has just flown by uh, and there's been so much fantastic conversation in the chat. I feel sorry for those on the podcast not to be part of it, but we're glad you're listening and a hat tip again to shareable for that. Uh, let's hear final thoughts. Uh, we're going to go Kali, then Lydia, then Fatula, then I'll close us out. Kali? Sorry, I was on mute. Yeah, I, I'm loving uh, the questions that are that are in here and uh, relish the opportunity to try to answer uh, some of these. Unfortunately, uh, I am behind on producing uh, a work to to kind of answer, at least from our perspective and our experience, uh, some of these different pieces. Uh, but I do want to just share and comment um, a couple of things that came up uh, in closing. One, uh, I think we are at a phase now, just given um, you know where most cooperatives are at. Just to take that that piece, uh, yes, they I think they are struggling. 
And yes, our actual productive capacity right now is low relative to the overall economy. But I would stress that we need to do, uh, we need to focus on extending our productive kind of relationships with each other first, over and above trying to do a bunch of policy shifts. And that the more we can do concrete producing with each other and planning, you know, with each other to serve different needs, we would overall strengthen our capacity for the long term. And then the policy shifts can have to happen after that, because I think that will help us forge much more unity. The other piece I would would just stress is that I wanted to, to you know, like we've had a couple of things here that have forced us over the years to shift how we think about things. And we haven't grown into everything that we've kind of shifted into by far. But just to give you an example, then, then to, to close, you know, where where we are roughly like the real unemployed population is roughly about 50 percent between those who are un, un, underemployed and permanently or structurally unemployed. Now, the thing that we flipped on that was that what that means is a lot of people have a lot of time. Right. Uh, so you can look at that as a, a kind of historic problem, which it is. Or you can look at it on, on reverse, like what, what assets are there? So we can kind of combine that with the other self-organized activities because those folks in our, these folks in our community aren't, uh, you know, there are no extensive social welfare programs or, you know, we don't, we don't have a real welfare state or anything approximating in Mississippi. So what that means is that so many people in our community are actually surviving through various types of mutual aid support within their families and communities. If we could find some way to operationalize that so that the lines of sight are not just amongst people who exist, you know, who are your family or people that you know, or people in your church or your mosque, et cetera, then we can find a general way to kind of share with, you know, resources within our broad community along these mutual aid lines. That's a solid political block. So it's a question of how do we kind of identify what ex exists to help people, so, you know, survive. And then find some way to kind of operationalize it through democratic means. We turn that kind of informal power to a formal power, and then we can leverage that to do the type of resourcing that you know we're talking about. Where the money for public banking comes from, or where would this resources for the alternative currency or time banking comes from? It ultimately has to come from us, and that's an organizing challenge, right? And so, as part of this thing is like, how do we think differently about what actually we do have and reposition it to to maximize? Its potential strength. It's it's easier said than done, but I do think there's a kind of flipping the script that we have to do in our minds to figure out, you know, how to come up with the creative organizing solutions that present themselves to us. Otherwise, we just kind of keep asking for resources like from the state and capital, which we know is not coming or it's not going to come on terms that are beneficial to us. So I would just like to to you know present some of that. Uh, uh, from our experience uh, into the mix uh, and offer it as a share and hopefully others, you know, can adopt and pick up and take the torch even further than what we've been able to do with it to this point. Thank you, Kali. Lydia. Thank you, David. Um, the policy advocacy is, is not easy work. This is like half of the work we do at the network, uh, promoting policies that are friendly to community land trust uh, statewide, not only in taxation, but making funds uh, available for those projects. And if, if you don't have bandwidth or your organization doesn't have the bandwidth to do this work, join a network, join a coalition. Uh, this could be a network of co-ops, a coalition that is doing uh, your line of work and empower them to do the policy work. In our case, uh, we formed a C4 uh, organization to do to be the lobbying arm at the state level, uh, because we couldn't just do the 20% of housing advocacy as a nonprofit. And so uh, think outside the box about what needs to happen for that policy work to get done. Because if we don't continue pushing our elected officials and our governors to dedicate and invest uh, funding in all these uh, you know, critical infrastructure and innovations, they're not going to do it. <laughs> so we it's up to us to to continue pushing on that on that front. And I'm very happy to hear all the work you guys are all doing in in the various areas. Petula? So uh, 
plus one to everyone. Um, so happy to be on a panel with you all. Uh, Ji Yang, you're absolutely right. I want to uplift that there are still people who don't know. So there's some advocacy and outreach that still needs to happen. And uh, Kali, to your point, we got to figure us out first. If, if, we, if we can join together, even as Lydia said, form coalitions. I am uh, the manager of a coalition um, where we are highlighting the strengths of members within the coalition so that we can learn from each other. That's a project we've been working on for the past couple of months in terms of different practices and how those practices intersect and how we can learn uh, from research, participatory action research, how that helps with a people's movement assembly and why that's necessary and how all of the work that we're doing over overlaps and intersects. And um, uh, you're giving me a, a lot of food for thought is like, how do we get stronger together? How do we align ourselves and get on the same page and figure ourselves out so that uh, we can then you know, be a force to reckon with in terms of policy, et cetera. And so if you would like to learn more about the coalition, uh, Democracy Beyond Election, I will place um, my email and the website again in the chat and, and thank you all. Dion. Oh, I just want to say, I, I feel um, just very honored to be in the presence of you all um, and, and um, and the folks that are, are um, listening and watching. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, thank you, Ji Young. And Ji Young channels my, uh, some of my closing thoughts. Number one, you see why uh, I put together this group of rock stars, right? Uh, and it's kind of like jazz, right? Like uh, each playing a particular instrument, but making uh, a song together. And uh, I wanna close uh, with three quick things. Number one, Political education is absolutely critical. I want to channel my dear friend and comrade and mentor, Jerome Scott. Uh, and from my way of thinking, we have to experiment and we have to theorize and theory and practice. Because here's the thing, y'all, theory without practice, that's mere contemplation. But practice without theory, that's just randomly doing shit and hoping that something transformational will happen. I mean, you might make a, 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 a policy change or two, but you're not gonna restructure the political economy the way our four panelists have been talking about without an actual strategic plan that you're then employing. And I will say using the working class and ordinary people exercising their own latent power. Which brings me to point two, and that is the role of electoral politics. Some of y'all know, I, I fool with electoral politics. I believe that there is a place, but it is a tactic. It's not even really, like, it's not even a strategy for me, right? It is just a tactic. Um, because to me, the whole point is to learn from the global South who don't separate movements from electoral politics. They actually understand that you build your power at the movement level with a mass movement that then engages in politics, but you don't chase after elected official to lobby and beg the way we're trained to think about in this country. Instead, they make demands and they say either you will do this or we will replace you. And there is a different way. I mean, the global South is just so far ahead of the US. And I will say because they have a clarity around imperialism and capitalism and settler colonialism, like they understand these things and they operate uh, differently. The third thing that I uh, really wanted to, to say in my final thoughts, Again, deep appreciation to each of our panelists, Patula Hanley of the Democracy Beyond Elections and Participatory Budgeting Project, Ji Young Park, uh, a fellow with the Sustainable Economies Law Center and active in the Los Angeles public banking movement, Lydia Lopez of the California Community Land Trust Network, where she serves as co-coordinator, but also on the board of directors of the U.S. Solidarity Economy Network, and Kali Akuno of Cooperation Jackson, who also is on the board with Lydia and myself at the U.S. Solidarity Economy Network. And remember, this is the third in a series that we call Imaginal Cells of the Solidarity Economy. The Imaginal Cell, if you don't know it, 
It's what a butterfly does when they go into the chrysalis and their imaginal cells begin to reimagine what that organism can be. And I'm suggesting, and we're suggesting that we can reimagine what our entire society can be and what our role in it. And we can literally transform from a caterpillar to a chrysalis to a butterfly. Stay tuned, keep fighting, can't stop, won't stop. Peace.